Hello everybody, I'm Miss Jessica from EVPL McCullough and today we're continuing our chapter book story time variety pack. And with our chapter book story time, we're reading just a little bit of a book so that you can be introduced to our amazing collection. There are so many things to choose that sometimes it's hard to know which book to pick to read next. So this is hopefully, hopefully giving you a preview and um, maybe some titles that you are excited about and want to continue reading. And already I have Harper here with my snuggly blanket because we always want to make reading an, an enjoyable experience. And the last time that we were together, we spun our wheel and we landed on realistic fiction. So this is a book that is based in reality, tells a story that could very much happen to someone and maybe even pulls from the author's life as they put some experiences into their story. So we are going to be reading I Can Make This Promise by Christine Day. And I will say that this book caught my eye just because of the cover. And then when I started looking at it and reading about it, it sounded like a very interesting story, maybe from a perspective that we don't get very often. So this book was, um, published in 2019, so it's actually a very recent book, and we do have it available as not only a print edition, but we do have it as an ebook and an e-audiobook, so we have lots of ways for you to enjoy this if you want to keep reading. Okay, so let's see what the inside cover says. It says, Edie has always known that she is half Native American. She also knows that her mom was adopted by a white couple and has no connection to her birth family. So even though Edie is curious to learn about her heritage, she realizes her mom doesn't have any answers. That is, until the summer day when she and her friends discover a box hidden in the attic full of old photos of a woman who looks just like Edie and letters signed, <coughs> excuse me, love, Edith. Suddenly, Edie has a flurry of new questions about this woman who shares her name. Could she belong to the native family that Edie never knew about? But if her mom and dad have kept this secret from her all her life, how can she trust them to tell her the truth? This is a story of a girl grappling with her family's complicated story and figuring out how to tell her own. So, we have a little bit of a mystery going on here with um, this character's experience. All right, so we are going to be starting. And this book actually has, at the beginning of it, a prologue. And that is just a little bit of a, an introduction into a book or an introduction into a story that we'll probably connect later on as we keep reading. So, prologue. Where are you from? I never thought of myself as different until my first day of kindergarten. I remember round tables with flimsy tops, plastic chairs with shiny metal legs, books and stuffed animals were gathered around a fake tree in the reading corner, cloud-shaped mobiles, um, mobiles hung from the ceiling, strands of paper raindrops suspended in midair, a bright yellow sun was painted across one wall, the alphabet was spelled out in a rainbow of uppercase letters. My classmates already seemed to know each other. Everyone was talking and laughing and shouting. I was one of the tallest people in the room, but I felt invisible. I didn't know how to join the conversations, the noise. I wasn't even sure if I wanted to. Miss Vespucci saw me hovering near the classroom door. She hurried over and knelt before me. Her smile revealed straight white teeth. She reminded me of a fairy tale princess. Her voice was like a melody, her hair like spun gold. I imagined her singing lullabies to an audience of fawns and bluebirds. Hello, Edith. A jolt of surprise before I remembered my name tag. A school-issued lanyard was looped around my neck, clipped to a laminated square. Edith with an illustrated elephant. E for elephant, E for me. Wow, the teacher's grin widened as she stared at my face. What are you? I told her, I'm Edie. Oh, Edie, that's your preferred name? Where are you from, sweetheart? You're such a pretty girl. I live in Seattle. 
Yes, that's true. But where are you originally from? Seattle? Mrs. Vespucci laughed, but I wasn't sure what was funny. Do you know where your parents lived before they came here? Her questions made me feel panicked. This was my first test and somehow I was failing. I couldn't speak. I didn't understand what she was asking. I didn't know what she wanted from me. I've gotten the question a lot since then. Where, what are you? Where are you from? What am I? My father is American. My mother is Native American. Technically, dad has roots in Germany, England, and Wales, but I don't mention this because it feels dishonest. I've never visited these places. I don't know much about them. I'm not even sure where they are in the European continent. So I just say, dad is American, which works out fine because no one asks about him anyways. They jump straight to mom. They want to know what it means to be Native American. They ask me what tribe I'm from. They ask if I know what buffalo tastes like. They ask about my spiritual beliefs. They ask about the percentages and ratios of my blood. My answer remains the same. I don't really know. My mom was adopted. Okay, so chapter one, the Big Bang, July 4th. Fireworks are banned in my neighborhood. There are too many trees, too many houses. So this year for the 4th of July, my parents are taking me to the Tulalip, Tulalip, excuse me, Tulalip Reservation about 20 miles north of the city. They sell all kinds of fireworks and they have a huge field where you can set them off. This place is crowded and colorful and chaotic. It's amazing. My parents lead the way to the booths. There's a food truck parked beside the big gravel lot selling authentic Mexican tacos. The smell of cooked seasoned meat fills the air Mixing with the peppery gunpowder from all the fireworks, I can practically feel it in little flecks of grime all over my skin. Mom asks, do you need these, Edie? She opens her palm, revealing a little package of earplugs. I shake my head. I'm okay, thanks. The booths are set up in several rows. The nearest one is decorated with red, white, and blue streamers and a huge banner that shouts fireworks in bold letters. The booth across from it is lime green with little alien heads and UFOs outlined all over it in black paint. Another is hot pink with candy colored rockets arranged in bouquets on its counter. The next is blue with the Seattle Seahawks logo stitched in stark white and silver plus the number 12. The one is shaped like the space needle. I like this graffiti. I like the bright colors, the bold lines. I wonder if they created drawings and stencils first or if they just grabbed their cans of spray paint and improvised. I also wonder if they keep sketchbooks or have favorite places to draw like I do. I'm always curious about other artists and their habits, their unfinished drafts, their inspirations. As we keep moving, I can't help but drink it all in. I've never been to a reservation before. Each person I make contact, eye contact with feels significant. It's possible some of them are distant relatives. I could be walking past cousins or aunties right now, and I wouldn't even know it. A rock and roll version of the Star Spangled Banner starts blaring out of nowhere, and I glance around myself trying to find the speakers. But as the loud electric guitar mimics the sound of, oh, say, can you see? I instead notice a food vendor with signs that say they have traditional Native American fry bread. I stop and stare. The line is huge. The menu is handwritten on a whiteboard. An ice-filled cooler contains soda and bottled lemonades. There are two open counters, one where you pay, one where you wait for your order. I watch as a girl receives her food. The fry bread is rumpled golden brown disc served on a paper plate. It almost looks like an elephant ear. As the guitar transitions to a choppy, what so proudly we hailed, something knocks into the back of my legs. I stumble and turn around. A dog peers up at me with watery bloodshot eyes. He's panting hard and his fur is mangy, but he looks happy, surprisingly calm. I thought all dogs hated fireworks, but he doesn't seem to mind the noise and chaos. He just looks a little lost. I extend my hand to him. Hi, puppy. He lifts his big nose, sniffs my fingers, pushes a snout against my palm. His tail wags ferociously as he inches closer. That's a good boy, I say. You're a good boy. I check around. 
his neck, but he isn't wearing a collar. I glance around. Cash registers chime and shouts of laughter are eclipsed by a huge boom. Shoes crunch across the gravel. A group of men walk by in mismatched basketball jerseys. A teenager adjusts her sunglasses. Her colorful beaded bracelets side down, slide down her brown forearm. A guy with two long dark braids is wearing a Batman tank top. A toddler is mid-meltdown, hands clamped over her ears, face crumpled as she cries out. Poor thing, I mumber. Mummer, I stroke the dog's head distracted. Where's your owner? The rock and roll version of the Star Spangled Banner is no longer recognizable. The guitar riffs have dissolved into wails. It doesn't sound like, or the ramparts we watched. It doesn't sound like anything. Just crashing notes and frantic energy. I turn in the other direction and an older woman catches my gaze and holds it and holds it. She's seated on a stool at the edge of the crowd. Her t-shirt bears the message, find our missing girls. Huh, wonder what that's about. Edie? Mom's voice cuts through the blaring guitar and blasting fireworks. What are you doing? She places her hand on my shoulder and gently steers me away. Honey, you can't pet random dogs like that. It's not safe. Look at how big he is. He might hurt you. Dad's behind her. Your mother's right. I know he's cute, but you need to be careful. But he's alone, I say. Shouldn't we help him find his way home? Someone will come along for him, Mom says. And I can barely hear her as the car guitar screeches. Don't worry. She tucks me away, but I look back. The dog sits in the middle of the walkway. His ears perk up and his tongue rolls out of the corner of his mouth as he watches me leave. We stop at a booth called the Big Bang. The words are spelled in swollen graffiti font. The letters are big and puffy and white and they remind me of squished marshmallows. A brown skinned teenager stands behind the counter. He's wearing a white tank top and has a little barbell pierced through his eyebrow. He grins if he's, as if he's genuinely happy to see us. Afternoon, folks, he flicks his chin up in green. How's it going? Dad nods in response. We're doing well, thank you. A short silence follows as we look around his booth. The top shelf holds the biggest boxes encased in glossy wrappers. Their labels alternate between sounding patriotic and menacing. Rockets red glare, the American outlaw, rolling thunder, sabotage. The lower shelves contain smaller boxes and open trays of fireworks. Where are you guys from, he asks. We live in Seattle, Mom answers. Ah, he nods understanding. That urban life, you like it out there? Mom smiles, most of the time. Good, good, glad to hear. He drums his hands on the countertop. So, what kind of fireworks are you looking for? I know we want some sparklers, some Roman candles, maybe a fountain or two. All right. He turns to his lowest shelf and grabs two trays, tilting them forward to reveal their contents. I have these two kinds, he says. One tray is filled with bundles of slender gray-brown sticks. The other has bundles of hot pink sparklers. The top half of each one is wrapped in dyed magenta yellow teal tissue paper and laced with a gold ribbon. We pick the pretty ones and select some Roman candles and two stubby fountains. The boy places a long cardboard box on the counter before us and starts piling our stuff inside. Anything else? Both my parents look at me and the boy does too. I feel the heat rise in my cheeks. I go rigid under their scrutiny. Edie? Mom asks. Her voice is gentle, a half whisper at most. I glance at the shelves and shrug, feeling awkward. I wish she wouldn't have said anything. I hate being put on the spot in front of strangers. The boy snaps his finger. Here, he says, how about this? He crouches behind the counter. I can hear the scrape of crates sliding across the ground. He straightens back up and stands directly across from me, smiling. Ever seen one of these before? He holds up a cylinder wrapped in turquoise label. It has a black platform on one end. It fuse, its fuse pops out the top like a little red tongue. I shake my head. Really? He sets it down on the counter, taps it with his fingers. That's too bad, he says. These guys are my favorites. Out of everything I've got here, that's why I keep them hidden. They're reserved for special people. Hi, Harvey. He winks and now I'm certain my face is all red and splotchy. What is it? I mumble, hoping he'll stop looking at me. He slides his firework across the counter. A gift, he says. A surprise. I inspect the wrapper hesitating. Go on, he urges. Take it. 
I accept the firework and hold it close against my chest. Thank you, Mom says, her voice brimming with gratitude. She retrieves her wallet from the depths of her purse. How much do I owe you? Twenty-four fifty. Dad hoists the box into his arms and frowns. That's a bit low, isn't it? It's all good. The boy inclines his head toward, toward me. Little Sisters is on the house. My parents protest. They want to pay him the full amount, but he waves off their offer. He says, don't worry about it. Just take care of yourselves out there. And he sounds like he really means it. Chapter two, the boy in the war zone, July 4th. It's like a war zone out here in the field. Whistling fireworks streak across, across the sky, long tails of light streaking behind them like shooting stars. The big ones shoot out of their boxes with hollow thumps and explode with echoing claps that set off car alarms. Fountains erupt in glittering sparks, hissing softly as they stand stationary on the ground. The whole meadow is littered with knocked over tubes and blackened boxes, empty shells that are still venting plumes. The air is smoky and filled with flying bits of debris. There's so much of it, it's difficult to breathe. We've already gone through the entire box. We're standing a respectful distance away from other people. Thickets of trees line the field's perimeter. An explosion goes off perilously close to a cluster of dry looking leaves and branches. I swallow and turn my attention to our fountain as it huffs blue smoke and embers. Within moments, it fizzles out in a dwindling orange flame. Dad's hand grazes my shoulder. Is it time for your mystery firework? I nod. Can I be the one to light it? My parents exchange glances. Mom shrugs and nods, granting her permission. Dad says, sure, I don't see why not. He leads me to a spot where our fountain burned out. I set the firework on the ground and Dad retrieves the lighter from his pocket as we both crouch. Just be careful with your fingers, he says. Don't tilt the flame towards your knuckles, and once the fuse is lit, be sure to back away quick. I'm 12, I tell him, not two. Stop worrying so much. He laughs. Yeah, well, I guess I should be grateful you even asked. When I was your age, I didn't think, I don't think I waited for permission to do anything, especially when it came to fireworks. I can't help but smirk. Dad's stories often fit in one of two categories. He either talks about Boy Scouts Little League and his top grades in math and science, or he talks about his mischief, the pranks he used to pull, the hospital trips when daring stunts didn't go well. It's hard to imagine that some of his stories really happened, but maybe that's because I've only known him since he became a dad. He hands me the lighter and I throw a quick glance at mom. She responds with one of her warmest smiles, the kind that makes her pupils shine and her eyes crinkle around the corners. Mom doesn't share many of her childhood memories. I know she was smart and, or excuse me, she doesn't have endless nostalgic stories like dad does. I know she was smart and shy and I and liked to read books. I know she and Uncle Phil didn't get along as, until they were teenagers. I know she was a writer for her high school's, high school's newspaper, but that's pretty much it. Well, Dad says, what are you waiting for? I like the fuse. We both stand and back away swiftly. His arm crosses in front of me protectively. Mom's warm hands grip my shoulders as we watch the fuse disintegrate into nothing. It goes off with a small pop. Something shoots up and out of it so fast it's just a blur. I throw my head back amazed by how high it goes, how far it flies. What is it, I cry. Mom gives my shoulders a reassuring squeeze. Just wait, you'll see. It's hanging in the sky, floating weightlessly. It isn't burning or shooting sparks. It isn't like any of the other fireworks, I gasp. It's a parachute. It looks like a tiny hot air balloon. It's striped turquoise and white. It flutters and flaps as it sails toward the earth, coming down in a diagonal line, heading toward the open field. Horrified, I break free of my mother's grasp. Edie! Before she can say anything else, I'm running straight across the minefield, dodging around people, charging through the crossfire. I keep my eyes glued to the little parachute as it meanders through the dangerous atmosphere. It looks far too innocent amid the shower of sparks. I chase it halfway across the field. When it's only about 15 feet off the ground, I see a boy aiming his Roman candle in the same direction. No, I shout, wait! The boy turns his head and pivots his body just in time. The Roman candle's projectile misses my parachute by several feet. I'm completely out of breath now. I stop to a slow and catch the parachute in midair. 
There's a little cardboard tube attached to it connected with thin white strings. The striped parachute wrinkles and deflates in my hand. Hey! I look up. The boy with the Roman candle is staring at me. He's wearing a backward facing baseball cap. A tuft of his black hair is sticking through the open gap. He's also wearing a black t-shirt and basketball shorts. He looks like he's around my age. Sorry, he says with a grimace. I wasn't trying to point it at your parachute. A green fireball shoots out of his Roman candle with a muted bunk. He doesn't even bother to watch it arc through the air. It's okay. A blue fireball shoots out of his candle and he still doesn't look away. I'm Roger, he says. He takes a step closer and holds his hand free, his free hand out to me. It seems odd to introduce myself to a boy in the middle of a war zone, but I accept the handshake anyway. Edie. His palm is warm and soft. A purple fireball erupts from this candle, but I only see it in my peripheral vision because, excuse me, hiccup. We're face to face now. His eyes are the warmest shade of brown I've ever seen. His teeth are a bright white flash as he smiles at me. Butterflies surge in my stomach. My blush warms my cheeks. He says, hi. He's still smiling. His hand is still folded in mine. Harper is being very difficult and chewing on some plastic. Harper, come here. Can you come over here? You look native, he says, but I don't think I've ever seen you before. What nation are you? I think fast and stutter. Oh, I mean, yes, I'm native, um, but Edie? I drop Roger's hand like a hot potato. Two silhouettes are moving through the thick gray fog, bits of debris and shrapnel rain around them, like the little black spots that appear on screens in old movies as they come closer. I can see the relief on my parents' faces. Oh, good, Dad mutters, sweetheart. You can't just run off like that, okay? Come on, let's go, it's getting late. As an afterthought, he adds, I'm glad you got your parachute. I respond with a muted nod and speed walk away from Roger. My parents lead the way back across the field. I follow a few steps behind and risk a quick glance at Roger before he disappears in the fog. He's staring after me. His Roman candle is still poised in the air, but the tube is smoking, empty. I lift my hand in a wave. He smiles as he waves back. All right, and we're gonna stop there. Um, there's actually a break in the story, so we're stopping right there because it is still quite a number of pages until chapter two. And um, so we're gonna stop just, be, or excuse me, um, I misspoke. I wasn't looking correctly. So we only have a couple more pages to get to chapter three. So we'll keep going. My parents and I are in the car now, zooming down the freeway. Fireworks bloom all along the darkened hillsides. The sky is like a swath of indigo velvet. I'm still thinking about the dog I saw. I wonder if he ever found his owners, his family. I hope someone was there for him. I hope he's curled up in front of a fireplace right now with a full belly and a cozy rug, or maybe he's standing in a bathtub, his tail whacking the tiled walls behind him, his fur lathered in fragrant bubbles. Actually, these are some great images. Maybe this could be the topic of the story for the film Amelia, Serenity, and I are working on. I whisk my phone out of my pocket and open our group chat. Happy 4th of July, I type. Movie meeting tomorrow? I got a new idea. Serenity's response is hesitant. Happy 4th. Yes, can't wait. Where should we meet? I ask, Amelia's house? I stare at the screen for a moment, waiting for Amelia's response. When it doesn't come, I tuck the phone back into my pocket. Maybe it's only my imagination, but it seems like Abelia takes forever to reply these days. Sometimes she doesn't even answer at all. Since the summer began, the group chat has mainly been filled with messages ex exchanged between me and Serenity. Mom giggles, look, she says. She turns around and shows me her phone screen. Phil just sent me this. Uncle Phil sent mom two gifs and a text message. The first is a firewall, firework. The second is a waving American flag. The text reads, happy fourth to my favorite sister and favorite bro-in-law and my favorite niece. Love you all, but especially Edie. Excited to see you soon for summer barbecues. Nice, I say. Yes, she agrees, very sweet. Mom turns back around and starts typing her response. Hey, mom, hmm? Why are fireworks only allowed on the reservation? She stops typing, looks up. I meet her gaze in the rearview mirror. I was just thinking, I say, about how fireworks are banned in our neighborhood because of all the fire hazards, but there are still a lot of trees around that field and there are houses nearby. And it wasn't just like one or two houses, there were a bunch of them. I scoot forward in my seat. 
So why is it allowed there? Why don't the same rules apply? She doesn't answer at first. I wait and listen to the ongoing whoosh of cars on the freeway around us, the dingy yellow bellow of the truck's diesel exhaust, the low distant wail of sirens. Finally, she responds with, it's complicated. I wait for her to explain. She doesn't. I w Have you ever heard of fry bread? Yes. Why? Have you ever tried it? A few times. Really? I scoot even further, straining against the seatbelt. Do you know how to make it? What are the ingredients? Can we cook it at home? They are selling some at a booth and I wanted to try it, but I didn't get a chance. Maybe we can make it at home. I don't know, we'll see. It's a traditional Native American food. I say excitedly, we should make it at home. Maybe. I lean back in my seat. The freeway curves around a bend. Bright white headlights gather behind us, around us. Their beams pierce the dark, illuminating the interior of our car with its strobes. Rail ta red taillights glow ahead as we follow them home. I think about Roger. He was the first person to ever say those words to me. You look native. And it didn't feel presumptuous. It didn't feel like a wild guess. It was like he recognized me, like he saw something in me. I wonder what that something was. Okay, so we're gonna stop there with chapter three. Um, so I really like the way this author writes. She's very, very descriptive. And I don't know about you guys, but as I was reading this just now, I could almost picture being in that field, seeing the fireworks, the way she described everything so clearly. Um, so we haven't even gotten to the mystery part of this and how Edie uh, is trying to discover who she is, what her heritage is, and maybe what her mother's story is. So I'm interested to keep going. I would love to see, does she ever meet Roger again? Do we ever find out what happens to the dog? Um, does she discover more about her heritage? Is her mom able to maybe see what part of um, a Native American tribe she belongs to? So. I have a lot of questions. And so if you are interested in continuing this story, don't forget, you can always get a print copy. You can reserve one online. You can give us a call. We can help you with that as well. You can come into one of our locations and we would be happy to help you that way as well. So we're going to pause here and see what we're going to be reading next time. So I'll see you in just a second. All right, so we're gonna see what we're going to be reading next time. We just did realistic fiction, so we possibly have adventure, science fiction, historical fiction, humor, fantasy, spooky, mystery, and then back to realistic fiction. Now, if we happen to land on something that we have done recently, I will spin again just because that's the whole purpose of this. We want a variety of different materials. And Harper's right behind here, so hopefully we don't startle her too much. All right, here we go. Oh, historical fiction. Um, Let's see, I don't think we've had that one in a while. So we will be looking at a historical fiction book next time. And that's kind of exciting. I always love to kind of go into the past and see experiences that others might have had. Well, thank you for joining me today. I hope to see you again next Friday. If you go to evpl.org, you can see all of our resources, see what events we have coming up so that you can enjoy them either from your home or come in and see us. And also, if you like and follow us on social media, you'll be just able to see anytime we post anything new and we do post events there as well. So again, thanks for joining me today. I will see you next Friday. Bye.